In this video, we're going to review the foundations of chemical kinetics from introductory chemistry that are going to be necessary as we dig into reaction mechanisms in organic chemistry as well. So, the dependence of the reaction rate on the concentrations of reactants is described by the rate equation or rate law. This is an equation that has the rate on one side, the rate constant on the other side, and concentrations of the reactants raised to some power on that right-hand side as well, and everything's multiplied together on that right-hand side of the equation. This constant that relates those concentrations raised to those powers to the rate is referred to as the rate constant lowercase k. And each of the exponents associated with each reactant gets a term, and it's called the kinetic order with respect to that reactant or of that reactant. We can also talk about the overall order of the reaction as the sum of these numbers, and we'll have occasion to do that in organic chemistry on a regular basis. Now, the nature of the rate law, specifically these exponents x and y, and to some extent the nature of the rate constant, depends on the reaction mechanism, the sequence of elementary steps leading from the reactants to the products. And just to talk about this in general terms, I wanted to give you an example of an organic reaction, A plus B going to C plus D here, and talk about how the mechanism might relate to the rate law. What's happening here is the displacement of fluoride by the methoxide anion. Sodium plus is pretty much just a spectator. Methoxide anion comes in and kicks off the fluoride more or less, and we get product C, and sodium fluoride D is a byproduct. That's one way we could envision this happening, with methoxide coming in as fluoride departs. In that case, both A and B would be expected to be involved in the rate law and would have kinetic orders of one. But it's also possible to envision reactant A doing something before methoxide ever actually gets involved. For example, fluoride could depart from A before methoxide ever actually gets involved, in which case the kinetic order of B would be zero, it would not appear in the rate law, and only A to the first power would appear in the rate law. So the point there is the two different mechanisms have different rate laws, and as such we can use a measured rate law to rule out mechanisms. For instance, if we saw zero order behavior in B, or zero order kinetics in methoxide, we would know that this, what we'll call concerted mechanism with methoxide displacing fluoride all in one step is not possible and we can rule it out. And kinetics is very important for ruling out mechanisms in practice. To this day, it's extremely important and it's a, a key experiment to be run, figuring out the rate law when you're doing mechanistic investigations. We also know from introductory chemistry that reaction rate tends to increase with temperature. And the dependence of the reaction rate on temperature is entirely built into the rate constant, which does vary with temperature in accordance with the Arrhenius equation. The Arrhenius equation in includes this energy term, the activation energy, and that is you can think of it as a term that relates the reaction rate and the temperature. You've probably seen it represented as E sub A for activation energy in the past. We'll also use delta G double dagger for uh, activation energies in organic chemistry courses. This double dagger refers to the transition state, which is the structure at the top of the sort of hill in reaction coordinate diagrams. It's the structure at the maximum of energy in the course of an elementary step. So for a one-step process, the activation energy is this gap between the reactant energy and the transition state energy right here. And generally, at the same temperature, the smaller the activation energy, the, slow, the faster the rate. Let me say that again. The smaller the activation energy, the faster the rate, all other things being equal. And we can think about activation enthalpy and activation entropy orientational effects in the transition state. Having to arrange things kind of just so is an entropic contribution to the free energy of activation. And generally, just as in when we talk about delta S and spontaneity, negative delta S, d double dagger, negative entropy of activation is generally bad. More difficult transition states are going to have more negative delta S double dagger. That's going to lead to higher delta G double daggers and higher activation energies and slower reactions. So for example, asking three molecules to come together in a transition state, A, B, and C, 
that is a much more ordered situation, we might say, than asking just two molecules to come together. So this is going to have a more negative entropy of activation and make the activation energy, free energy, higher. One way we can think about changing the activation energy of the reaction is to introduce a compound that actually changes the mechanism such that the elementary steps involved in the new mechanism are lower in energy than the elementary steps of the mechanism without that substance. And catalysts are used to do this. A catalyst is defined as a species that accelerates a chemical reaction without being consumed itself. So it's not quite the same as a reactant. It can be used in less than one equivalent in what's called a substoichiometric amount. And because it's continuously regenerated, I think about it like a molecular conveyor belt on some level, we don't need a, a full equivalent. Now, because catalysts do accelerate the reaction, they necessarily have to be involved in the rate determining step in some way. And so they do appear in the rate law, but not in the overall balanced chemical equation. In organic reaction schemes, you will see catalysts most frequently written above the arrow, sometimes with an indication that they're used in less than one molar equivalent. The last important conceptual thing to say about catalysts is that they do not affect the delta G naught of the reaction. Catalysts cannot make a reaction that is thermodynamically disfavored favored. <laughs> the only way to do that is to actually change the reactants in some meaningfully meaningful way. Catalysts only lower the activation energy. They don't affect the energies of the reactants and pro products. And we can see that on this reaction coordinate diagram here with the reactant and product energies at the same points with and without the catalyst. What the catalyst does is change the mechanism, change the pathway followed from the reactants to the products. And here we see, for example, more elementary steps in the catalyzed mechanism, but an overall lower activation energy, lower than the uncatalyzed pathway, which has a huge barrier to climb across its one step, across this one step mechanism in blue. And this is typical of catalysts. They will change the mechanism entirely, but they'll do so in such a way that the overall activation energy of the reaction is lowered. Reaction coordinate diagrams, which are also known as energy diagrams, energy profile diagrams, reaction profile diagrams, they go by many names. These are a concise representation of the kinetics and thermodynamics of a reaction mechanism. They show how the energies of all the reactants and structures derived from the reactants change as chemical change takes place, as electrons move, bonds are made and broken, so on and so forth, and the reactants are ultimately converted into the products. So your basic structure for a reaction coordinate diagram has some measure of energy on the y-axis and some measure of reaction progress on the x-axis. And this is, you know, we can vaguely think of this as a kind of geometric coordinate. Maybe it's a bond length, maybe it's a bond angle, something like that. For relatively complex chemical change, it's got to be some kind of convoluted geometric parameter. You can just think of it as reaction progress with reactant structures over here and product structures over here. Returning to the y-axis for a second, this energy may be free energy, enthalpy, or internal energy, or as we see here, just potential energy. And it's often not clear what's actually indicated um, on the, on the y-axis here, but something like potential energy or free energy is usually a safe bet. Now what you'll see in the actual trace itself is a series of peaks and valleys. In each valley, we have a set of stable structures, st structures with some finite lifetime. These are either the reactants or products themselves, which do exist in valleys. These are typically cut off because they're the start and end of our diagrams. But we also will often see valleys in the middle, and each of these valleys in the middle is a temporary stable, stable species that is converted to something else. It's known as a reactive intermediate or intermediate. And each set of intermediate structures generated after each elementary step and consumed in the next is, is uh, in one of these valleys. At the peaks, we have these structures that are energy maxima, and these are called transition states, the top of the roller coaster, so to speak. And each elementary step is associated with one transition state. So a step here corresponds to going over a hump and then going down into a valley where we're either at a reactive intermediate or after the last step, we've made it down to the product. So each elementary step has this appearance of going up, 
and going down. Kind of like riding a roller coaster is how I think about navigating reaction coordinate diagrams. Because transition states are energy maxima, any sort of change in the molecular geometry is going to lower the energy of that molecule. So transition states are actually not directly observable. They have a lifetime that's shorter even than a single molecular vibration. That's something like less than one femtosecond, less than 1 times 10 to the negative 12 seconds. So we can't observe them directly, but we can infer their structures from the reactants and products of the elementary step by saying that at the top of the roller coaster, halfway between the reactants and products, roughly speaking, we're going to have partial bonds and partial charges. Bonds being made and broken are going to kind of be halfway along those processes. And as charges are shifting, well, charge is going to be incompletely shifted from one atom to another. So in the example shown on this slide, we have the displacement of bromide anion by chloride anion. So on the reactant side, we have Cl minus and methyl bromide is the reactant right here. And on the product side, we have methyl chloride and the Br minus anion. So from a curved arrow perspective, what's happening here is the formation of a chlorine carbon bond through electron flow like this and the cleavage of a carbon bromine bond through electron flow like this. At the transition state, we're going to have a partial bond between carbon and chlorine, since that bond is in the midst of being formed. And we're going to have a partial bond between carbon and bromine, because that bond is in the midst of breaking. Notice also that negative charge is shifting from Cl minus to Br minus. In the transition state, that negative charge is going to be shared between Cl and Br. So we see a delta minus indicating partial negative charge on the chlorine, where that charge is decreasing, I guess, well, increasing or decreasing in magnitude, if you like, from negative 1 to 0. And we have a delta minus at the bromine, where the charge is going from 0 to negative 1 in the transition state. So the upshot here is that the transition state has bonding and charge characteristics that are halfway between the reactants and the products. Reactive intermediates show up in these valleys on reaction coordinate diagrams, and these are directly observable and have finite lifetimes because they're living in an energy valley. So it actually takes some energy to convert a reactive intermediate into some other structure. There's an activation energy for anything that this structure is able to do. And an example of a reactive intermediate is the carbocation, classic reactive intermediate. Carbocations can be generated when a carbon-halogen bond breaks toward the halogen like this. So for example, when this carbon-bromine bond breaks toward bromine with the CBr electrons headed to the Br atom, we end up with a positively charged carbon and Br minus. And these are both intermediates. Well, I guess, OK, Br minus is a product because it undergoes no further chemical change. But the carbocation is absolutely a reactive intermediate. And to complete this mechanism, chloride anion adds to it. There's an activation energy associated with that. To continue along the roller coaster, we do have to climb a slight hill. But generally, once we get to reactive intermediates, these processes will be pretty fast. That carbocation is not a happy camper, as we'll see a little bit later. So reactive intermediates, again, sit in these valleys. They have finite lifetime, and they tend to have charges and relatively unstable structures that prompts them for further reaction to go onto the products.